Yeah, yeah, sure. A very good evening to all of you. This is same Dr. Aditi Das Gupta, your host for today's program. The concept of green batteries centers on the development of energy storage solutions that minimize environmental impact, reduce carbon emissions, and utilize sustainable materials. In India, green battery technology holds substantial promise for advancing sustainability. The country's rapid urbanization, industrial growth, and push towards renewable energy require reliable and environmentally friendly storage options. Green batteries can play a transformative role in reducing dependency on fossil fuels, particularly in sectors like transportation and energy, where the environmental footprint is higher. As India pursues a sustainable future, the adoption of green battery technology will be instrumental in addressing the country's energy storage needs and promoting environmental responsibility. Enhanced research and investment in this area, along with strategic policy support, can position India as a leader mm -hmm. in green battery innovation, helping meet its ambitious climate goals while fostering economic growth. The Institute of Cost Accountants of India understands this. So today on 25th of October 2024, in its 19th Vasudeva Kutumbakam webinar series, the Sustainability Standards Board has organized a webinar on the topic overview of green battery concept and its future in enhancing sustainability in India. We are fortunate that today we have with us Mr. Chandrasekhar Chincholkar, sir. He's the founder and CEO of CMK Advisors LLP, Pune. Before we start our program, we would start with our institute anthem. Asvatu ma sad gamaya, tamhisu ma jyotir gamaya, mrityur ma mritam gamaya. Asvatu ma sad gamaya, tamhisu ma jyotir gamaya, Mrityur Mamritam Gamaya Asatu Masad Gamaya Tamasu Majutir Gamaya Mrityur Mamritam Gamaya Before we give the stage to our uh, main speaker today, let me introduce him. Briefly to introduce Mr. Chandrasekhar Chincholkar, his areas of work are investment advisory, startups and innovation advisory, and sustainability services. Sustainability services include ESG training, ESG roadmap, consulting, mergers and acquisitions, and CSR training. Mr. Chincholkar has 33 years of experience in the areas of corporate finance, capital markets, manufacturing, and consulting. He has done significant level of work in corporate fundraise, roadshows for Indian companies in India and overseas for fundraise, handled large manufacturing operations, and has done consulting in his previous various roles. He has worked in consultant with organizations of repute like Customized Energy Solutions India, Private Limited, KPIT Technologies Limited, KP Capital Advisors Private Limited, Barway Engineering Limited, Sunil High Tech Engineering Limited, Aventus Capital Private Limited, and Ambit Capital Private Limited, Refco CP Securities India Private Limited. He has done significant work on policy parameters at various levels and has shared papers on water, bamboo policy, EV policy, carbon markets in the past. SAR has been part of the new energy 
and new mobility issues and concerns and has contributed at various conferences in India on hydrogen, e-mobility, battery storage, etc. In 2023, Mr. Chincholkar addressed three events linked to the G20, including C20 at Pune, Sikkim and Delhi on topics like climate, climate finance, industrial and commercial decarbonization and green hydrogen opportunity for India. Since last one year, Mr. Chincholkar has been doing a lot of training, speaking at conferences on ESG BRSR principles. Currently, Sir is empaneled with the Institute of Directors as a faculty on the topic Board Strategy for ESG and Corporate Sustainability. He has also spoken at the ICSI, ICMAI, FICCI, FIO and CII on various topics including ESG. Mr. Chincholkar has been on the CII Western Region Committees like the Energy and Environment and Automobile and Auto Components for two years and also on the CII National Committee on Future Mobility and Batteries. Also been a part of coaching Shipyard Limited's two committees on Fuel Sale and Transportation and Green Batteries Committee. Nonetheless, by qualification, Mr. Chincholkar is an post accountant graduate and a CS both from India and UK, MS Finance from BITS, member of Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments UK, PG Diploma Holder in Environment Law and Policy from WWF and National Law School, Delhi, and E Masters MBA in Power Systems. Regulations, Economics and Management from IIT Kanpur and Diploma in Corporate Governance from ICSI. It is an absolute pleasure to have you, sir, with us. I mean, reading this, uh, your executive summary, it's, uh, it's a very big thing for me. We are man, very much proud and privileged to have you, sir. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Aditi, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be part of such a prestigious institute and be a member and also contribute towards uh, the growth of the prof profession in a very small way. Uh, so I, I hope the screen is visible. I can just uh, uh, put uh, uh, the presentation. Is the presentation yes, visible? Sir. Yes, sir, visible, sir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the topic for today is uh, overview of green battery concept and its future enhancing sustainability in India. So as Madam has read out my background, I have been working in the process in the area of uh, corporate finance, capital markets, investment advisory, you know, road shows for companies in India and abroad, and have done significant amount of fundraise for companies in the past. Uh, and last five, six years, I've been majorly involved into the new ecosystem of uh, new energy and new mobility. So new energy basically talks about, uh, uh, you know, batteries, uh, renewable energy, it also talks about hydrogen. So I've been presenting papers on various conferences and all the presentation that I'm doing today is an experience that has been put across, uh, you know, for the last 33 years plus as well as last five years in terms of uh, how things have evolved over over the last, uh, you know, few years in India and how it can actually benefit the uh, country as a whole. So the objective of today's presentation is to try and understand how green batteries will actually help India in a big way from a sustainability point of view because Batteries in, contribute significantly to transportation as well as to also storage of electricity in the in the future. So we are already seeing significant amount of rush for electric mobility. Uh, the number of vehicles that are sold uh, last year is almost touching, you know, at a cross 10 lakh vehicles. Out of which 60, 65 percent are two wheelers and balance are all three wheelers and four wheelers. But the number is ever increasing, and government itself has also kept a significantly higher target for electric mobility penetration as we will see it in the in the future slides. So the index for today is basically, you know, we will try and understand environment as a thought process and how we can, uh, how things are evolved over a period of time and how we can actually try and address some of the concerns which are come from these regulations uh, and uh, you know how it can be actually addressed in a, in a much uh, detailed way. Then basically talk about also talk about gain battery concept and current material usage, uh, components recycling, you know, India's electricity needs and all the other areas that are, uh, you know, mentioned in the particular slide. If you look at the emergence of, you know, uh, environmental governance that has actually evolved, why we should call it as governance? Because uh, <clears throat> now 
SEBI has come out with BRSR guidelines. And uh, you know, from 2012-13 onwards, there was BRR already, which is business responsibility and uh, reporting, which was already happening from 2012-13 onwards. And some of the companies adopted integrated reporting from 15-16 onwards, and then came the you know sustainable development goals. So if you look at the beginning of environmental governance, which has evolved, uh, evolved over a period of time, is starting from the Stockholm Conference in 1972, which first time mentioned about you know protection of environment because fossil fuel contribution was actually increasing in a big way. And if you know the history of US, uh, electric vehicles actually were in a, in a way, you know, uh, uh, presence in US, but somehow the, the technological, uh, uh, um, you know, advances happened so, uh, so much in the US that, you know, Ford was able to, General Motors and Ford were able to come out with uh, a car which was less than, I think, uh, $1,200, $1,300. And the cost of electric vehicle that point of time was something like two thousand two thousand dollars. So, looking at the you know uh, uh, purchasing value of money at that point of time, people started preferring uh, uh, you know uh, ICE internal combustion engine vehicles, and that is how the penetration of more EVs actually happened in the US. And slowly, electric vehicle, even though it was originated much earlier in in the US, had actually uh, you know send, say, seen the end of its life, uh, and then even, you know uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, which actually uses diesel and petrol as a fuel. Uh, you know, were penetrated in a big way. Then, then comes the 1992 Earth, uh, uh, you know, uh, Earth Summit, which actually happened under the UN framework, which was attended by 178 countries, uh, and the agenda was basically to protect the environment. Uh, then, after that came the uh, you know 2000, we came out with the Millennium Development Goals, which are the eight principles. These eight principles uh, were followed by companies. Then, in 2015, all these eight principles got converted to basically. Um, uh, you know, SDG goals, and we are aware of the 17 SDGs which are there today. And the 17 SDGs are also being significantly followed by companies uh, in a big way. A lot of companies report on individual SDGs in their balance sheet. And uh, uh, the <coughs> nine principles of uh, NGRBC, that is National Voluntary Guidelines on uh, Responsible Business Conduct, which have been actually framed in 2019, are basically a culmination of 17 SDGs, which are basically merged into uh, nine uh, NGRBC principles. So again, uh, the concept of BRSR actually in the framework, <coughs> especially the nine principles on which companies are supposed to report in a detailed way, actually comes from uh, uh, the 17 SDGs that actually uh, were framed by United Nations in 2015. So uh, then comes the protection of own rights, that is Article 226 and 32 of the Indian Constitution. Then Article 21 talks about impact on life, uh, and, and Article 21, which indirectly becomes a uh, uh, it supports what you know water as a uh, water as an impact you know idea of uh, uh, personal security for the for the for the mankind as well as, well as for the uh, you know citizens of india so all these are actually things which have evolved over a period of time and how uh, you know human life uh, also also originated is something to be seen from uh, this particular area if you look at uh, 1952 uh, the per capacity uh, per capacity uh, per, per capita availability of water was in the range of 500 liters Today, if you look at cities, the per capita availability of water is in the range of 100 to 150. <coughs> and the per capita availability of water in villages, which are supposed to be more, actually much more, is actually in the range of 40 to 50 liters per, per capita. So even though we, you know, a lot of availability of water is there for agriculture, which is the first right uh, of the farmers, uh, then comes the industry, uh, uh, so after, then comes the residents, and then comes the industry. So, you know, industry currently uses less than 3% water. But the important parameter is that uh, you know this three percent also consumes large amount of water, and today, tomorrow, if there is a shortage of water for human beings, obviously the industry will also get impacted. So this is how the governance actually has evolved over a period of time, and why we are talking about this because as we move towards the new energy and new mobility, especially the um, you know chip manufacturing or semiconductor areas, and also battery uh, you know areas or chemical manufacturing areas, they also require significantly higher amount of water. Then comes the Article 48 state powers of uh, for protection of uh, promotion of environment and forest and wildlife. Then, especially in, in 1972, Wildlife Protection Act was uh, you know cleared by the Parliament, both the Houses of Parliament. Then came the Biological Diversity Act. Uh, so, you know, state-wise again, Biological Diversity Act the implementation differs from state to state, and also what should be the best areas of uh, you know ensuring that the biological diversity actually happens will be actually dependent on you know, various state uh, governments and their uh, and their ability to enhance better policies in the in the coming days 
And then came the, the Paris Agreement also in 2015 along with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this agreement was basically signed by 196 countries and then 450 investment funds also you know, signed these agreements. One of the basic parameters of this agreement was that uh, uh, you know, developed nations uh, will actually uh, you know, support the developing nations for uh, by contributing capital as well as technology. And uh, the amount of money committed every year was around 100 billion dollars. But unfortunately, in terms of the money coming forward or the technology coming forward, not much has really come forward from that particular perspective. And now uh, uh, the, the actual implementation of Paris Agreement is not really happening in the way it should have. It was actually envisioned because you know uh, the agreements are signed between the governments, but the technology is there with the corporates. You know, so corporates will not be able to give technology unless they have the return criteria, you know, really met in terms of ROI and ROE. And that is the real problem which uh, you know, most of the people are facing in terms of getting even technology. So unless you are individually strong enough to really get have the corporate balance sheet or or image or you know goodwill in the market, you will probably not be able to attract a foreign company to partner with you in terms of technological advancements. And then in 2022, the NDCs were declared as we are aware you know, that you know life as a uh, as a principle has been accepted by uh, the prime minister. Then we are also talking about 500 gigawatt of renewable energy. Um, you know, and then then few other parameters like carbon emission intensity reductions are all is also there. Then we are also trying to talk about uh, you know have one billion tons of carbon emission reduction, and then uh, the recent amendments uh, uh, in terms of you know how various legislations towards waste management, battery battery uh, waste recycling, all these things are actually you know come to the fore, and that is how the entire principle wise or you know, governance wise things are actually evolved over a period of time in India. We are also reporting a lot of things on CPCB in terms of the environmental, uh, you know, protection uh, wise uh, plastic uh, declarations also. Then uh, because of uh, BRSR now, SOX, NOX and carbon emissions will also get disclosed in the balance sheets. So all these are areas where indirectly green batteries are going to contribute in a big way. And that is why this particular, you know, base of uh, environmental legislations or governance is something which is important for all of us to understand. So, you know, green battery concept, uh, as we are aware, you know, uh, it's not a case that, uh, uh, you know, most of you probably would have read somewhere as to what is green green batteries, uh, you know, but, but the objective is here is that we are able, should be able to use a battery which will actually help us in terms of uh, reducing the life cycle emissions of carbon emissions, basically, major in a major way, and how it can basically help us to, you know, uh, also impact the life, uh, uh, you know, life cycle assessment for all the products and services that we actually provide to our clients. So this is the uh, you know basic thing that uh, that basically comes from the concept of green batteries. So also important is the sustainable raw material supply chain that you really need to create, uh, uh, you know. And then currently uh, there are issues in terms of sustainable supply chain. Even the PLI scheme, which the government actually announced, also talks about 60% localization by in the next seven to eight years. And then products uh, uh, you know which are used uh, ma uh, uh, using sustainable mining practices like green fuel, etc., still uh, need to be really followed because if you look at current lithium mining, uh, the amount of uh, carbon emissions that actually happen because of uh, the usage of uh, fossil fuel for for mining of lithium ore, these are all key issues which are creating problems. But obviously, once unless you really do it uh, uh, or start it in some way, it is difficult for you to really move towards sustainability. So obviously, initial challenges will always remain, and uh, you know people will always come up and say, okay. Uh, or, you know, lithium mining is not really that way green, but unless you really start uh, mining, the, mining the lithium and taking it out because lithium can be in a big way recycled also in the future and government is actually coming out with guide, guidelines on recycling of, uh, you know, lithium and there are seven, eight companies already existing in India who are actually trying to do lithium recycling in, a, in some way or the other. So then, you know, these, these practices need to be followed. Then green energy, obviously we're talking about renewable energy and, and the storage part also. Uh, and then we talk about green hydrogen. So green hydrogen vehicle will also require some amount of batteries in the future, and those can actually be, you know, built from uh, uh, the kind of practices, the kind of material that we will talk about. So recycling, reuse of raw material consumed is is an important aspect aspect of circularity because uh, you know the objective of green batteries is that we should be able to significantly recycle and reuse the same material, so that <coughs> you know, assuming that the battery life is going to be around five to seven years. Typical battery life actually stands at two or three thousand cycles uh, on, on a life cycle basis. And typically, if you assume that one, the battery is getting charged once in a day, uh, you know, getting charged in the morning and getting discharged by the evening, 
and again tomorrow morning or or you know same day evening you ch you charge the batteries for next day use so assuming that you are able to do 300 or 325 cycles in a in a year and assuming that the battery life is uh, 2000 cycles so battery will actually last for around 6 years plus so um, um, you know there are there are people who are trying to in, in a way enhance the life of battery also so that it can actually run for 8 to 10 years if you look at some of the tenders which have been floated by uh, for the government agency is called conservation energy services limited they actually ask people to uh, you know come come and bid for 12 years of uh, uh, running of these buses at various uh, cities under city transport undertaking units and these buses actually require batteries uh, to run these evs and these batteries uh, or this this uh, area of work actually requires uh, running of these buses actually require 12 years of very strong commitment so people will have to actually consider using batteries once or twice and they're obviously trying to do it in such a way that they can actually enhance the life of the battery also then uh, you know uh, when you talk about green battery it also means that you are using a battery management system or a vehicle control unit or thermal management software which will actually go along with the battery green battery so that you are able to control the uh, life of the battery not uh, in not uh, uh, ensure that the or, or rather ensure that the battery is not heated up too much and then that can probably help in terms of saving of the life of the battery because too much of heat generation probably is not good for the battery it can actually also catch fire so you would have probably seen some of the incidences of vehicles uh, two wheelers or three wheelers or you know four wheelers of on running on evs uh, uh, basically catching fire so these are some of the problems and challenges but it's not the case that only batteries are getting catching fire even today con internal combustion engine which runs on diesel or petrol is also catching catching fire in some way or the other and the efficiency of internal combustion engine today is much not even today not to beyond 30 35 percent as compared to a fuel cell or, or a green hydrogen vehicle which today even can have a efficiency of 50 55 percent so these are some of the concepts of green batteries then um, uh, you know lithium the material usage uh, uh, you know one, one one ton lithium mining actually requires 500 tons of ore mining and the lithium required in the battery is actually dependent on five to seven seven percent if you have the right processes which are mostly currently available in china the recycling is possible to the extent of 95 percent of the lithium <coughs> but cost of recycling is an issue so obviously once if you have purchased lithium at say 700 rupees or 800 rupees a kg uh, you know if you are not able to recycling recycle it at lower cost obviously obviously the, the purpose of recycling will actually get lost so obviously evolution of technologies for these kind of uh, you know recycling also needs to be needs to happen really in a big way and that is an area for of work for even our engineers to really contribute from an indian perspective so in, in a way they can also contribute towards uh, you know r d for or for batteries where government is also actually giving a lot of incentives so if you look at cobalt uh, you know 70 percent of the world's cobalt is actually mined in a place called congo and we are uh, we are aware that congo is basically a landlocked country and mining is carried out majorly by underage children so that is also not a good issue from a social point of view uh, because social is also a very important parameter of ESG or sustainability. So, but obviously there are there are certain things which are happening not uh, not right. But uh, you know, even my uh, cobalt is also available in Australia, so people are going to Australia more and buying cobalt. But we obviously cannot ignore uh, you know Cong Congo as a country because they currently have world's largest resources in terms of cobalt. A lot of practice improvements are required in this area. Uh, to run back to you know this kind of systems on a sustainable basis nickel is also something which is currently being significantly imported into india uh, more, more mostly i believe it is coming from indonesia and our steel steel uh, large amount of stainless steel units also use uh, nickel as in a big way so nickel is also required in batteries it is also required in steel manufacturing and uh, you know commodity pricing for these kind of commodities is a real challenge because you know if you remember uh, you know, six months before the price of lithium was at significantly higher level. It had gone uh, gone to as high as I think 1200 to 1300 uh, rupees per kg. So those kind of pricing actually impacts the price of batteries because today battery contributes significant uh, you know percentage of uh, uh, the, the vehicle cost. And as we move from say internal combustion engine vehicle to a battery vehicle, the number of parts also go down. You know, the the, the real the real problem that auto component majors are going to face are is that uh, as we move towards more towards EV, the volumes will definitely increase, but the number of parts will also actually go down. So the, you know, there could be such some significant amount amount of impact on the value of the orders or value of the business also in the coming years. But that is something that will depend on how much you are able to adopt to new situation and how it can be, you know, uh, uh, put uh, put across or or put to use uh, by various auto component. Uh, 
partners who really ensure that the EV company also gets uh, uh, you know sustainable uh, supply of goods and services, and that that can be um, uh, you know that can be a good area for for all these companies. So sodium is a it can be a good uh, you know solution for India because sodium uh, is abundantly available in India. It's a, it's a very stable chemistry, uh, stable uh, raw material pricing, uh, and you know recyclable material. So as to, as far as recycling is concerned, and, and you know whatever I studied in the past. 60 to 70 percent of sodium can also be recycled. So these are the current, uh, you know, issues and challenges from a, a material perspective as far as batteries are concerned. People are trying to do different different type of experiments, but these two chemistries, that is lithium ion and sodium and ion, are the major, uh, you know, large amount of work that is happening globally. And if you look at some of the large Chinese companies like CATL, uh, they have major production and uh, major, uh, uh, you know, suppliers of batteries worldwide. So even if you look at uh, uh, you know, supply of batteries to Europe. Uh, these these are the Chinese companies which have been actually been supplying batteries to uh, uh, European companies. Uh, that is the reason why if you see Tesla vehicles, Tesla vehicle has, has its own batteries. So they have come out and they put up their own battery plant and they have invented a lot of things. So they are, they are doing their own uh, batteries and uh, they don't never wanted to have dependence on China. So that is uh, an area which they have taken care of from their own uh, supply chain perspective and made it green. <coughs> So physics, I mean, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've taken this extract from the site physics.aps.org. Green battery is the first battery that stores green electrons. Those are generated from renewable sources as such as wind solar. Uh, you know, battery itself is obviously being, uh, um, you know, the packaging itself is not really 100% renewable because most of the batteries you will have probably seen are packed in some or the other plastic uh, container or a steel container. So plastic, again, there are, there are issues in terms of plastic circularity. As we are aware that plastic remains on earth for 600 to 800 years uh, you know and then batteries can contain minerals which are mined from earth's crust uh, which again use fossil fuel so these are all issues and challenges for a for for a battery to be green you know other factors like life cycle therefore need to be or need to be sustainable and again when you talk about 100 percent uh, you know green battery and sustainability we need to ensure 100 percent recyclability and that is an area of work for indian companies and this will currently it is happening in some form. It will definitely happen to a large extent in the coming years as government has given significant amount of uh, you know support in terms of policy measures and incentives for companies to really look at cell manufacturing in India because cell is the basic major part of a battery. The cost of cell in a battery is almost 50 percent. So if you remember, most of us would have say played around with a with a Everity battery. And if you remove the black uh, uh, you know rod inside the battery, it is actually the cell. So India till date has not really manufactured even a single cell in, in the country, but there are few companies which have taken up the mandate after the government actually gave the incentive and they are now putting up plans to come out with the first cell manufacturing capacity in India. I think first quarter of next calendar year, first or second quarter of next calendar year, a lot of plants will be operational in terms of cell manufacturing and we'll probably see significant level of uh, uh, you know challenges coming in their, in their way, but I think a lot of large companies are there including Rajesh Exports, Reliance, then Ola, they are all go going ahead with capacity. Then companies like uh, Amraja Batteries, then Excite, they are also putting up facilities for lithium ion batteries. So they will try and manage because these are large, bigger companies with significantly strong profitability and cash flows. And they will be able to you know, overcome the challenges and provide India with a solution because India is a large transportation market as we will probably see the numbers in the coming slides. And then this will also help in terms of moving towards 100% green circularity in the coming days. So transition as an area, energy transition as an area, has three major components. One is uh, one is your uh, you know energy that is uh, uh, electricity that that will come from either uh, you know solar or wind or or maybe storage side. Second is your process related manufacturing uh, uh, you know uh, uh, emissions to be re re removed that can actually come from green hydrogen and related areas, including CBG and all. And then third could be EVs, which will again come from uh, batteries. So because EVs will need power and power will come from batteries. So these are three major areas from a sustainability point of view as far as. You know, broadly things are concerned to put it in a nutshell, uh, if we are running a manufacturing unit, 40 percent of emissions actually come from electricity, 40 percent actually come from process side and 20 percent actually come from vehicular mobility. So if you are uh, trying to address say. Uh, areas of concern for a services company like a software company or a, or a financial services company like bank or financial company, NBFC, 80% of their emissions will actually come from uh, 
uh, come from electricity because they use mostly um, you know power during the day and maybe if they're running in shifts then they'll probably use uh, storage at some point of time so uh, you know either you generate higher power and then store it for within the batteries which can be used during the peak hours requirement in the evening uh, so that 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 particular power also becomes uh, renewable so this is the uh, area of work for most of the large uh, you know indian software companies as well as data centers because india is coming up with large number of data, data centers and you would have probably seen in a places like uh, uh, you know mumbai or pune or you know some areas of uh, and then noida gurugram then some um, you know including cities like kolkata are getting large number of data centers so these these data centers will require significant amount of renewable energy because and then again ai ml use will also enhance the requirement of electricity as you would be aware that uh, typical activity done by a human being requires if, if it requires x amount of power on a daily basis ai ml will probably require any, anything between 6 to 7 times that power so if people are concentrating more on ai ml solutions obviously they will need to have more electricity production in the coming days so these are all you know areas as from a green battery perspective which are important for all of us so let us try and understand how indian energy scenario is actually emerging currently from a renewable energy perspective we are at 175 gigawatt our per capita energy consumption is only 1200 units and most of these 1200 units is coming from uh, you know cities like uh, delhi uh, mumbai calcutta pune hyderabad chennai bangalore all these all these bigger cities because in in uh, villages the per capita consumption probably must be less than uh, you know 100 to 150 units so if you look at as compared to that you know our, our population is today 140 crores usa has a population which is one fourth of india but the, the power consumption in us is 12000 units so you can imagine uh, you know 12000 units obviously means uh, uh, you know 1000 units average on a, on a on a per month basis and if you take the energy prices in the us the energy prices in the us actually vary from uh, 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 you know 12 13 rupees per per unit to even there are places like california they the price at some point of time was as high as 25 rupees per unit so you know the, the per, per person or per family electricity bill in us is significantly higher as compared to you know per per capita uh, in india in india per capita is 1200 units so per month it becomes 100 units so 100 units you can imagine at uh, you know seven or eight rupees what could be the bill including some surcharge and taxes and all it could be in the range of 1200 units so um, uh, you know the government has kept a target uh, as far as the our commitments under uh, um, COP26 also goes. We have given a price target of 500 gigawatt by 2030. Out of which 450 so will actually come from solar, and 50 will come from other renewable sources. At average 4 crore per megawatt, uh, this requires significantly higher amount of investment of around 20 to 30 trillion. And uh, you know, as far as most of the solar projects are concerned, the government standard government norm is that 30% of the project cost has to come from equity. Balance will be funded by banks and financial institutions. So, you know, this will actually mean a six to nine trillion dollars for equity coming in from Indian companies or foreign companies who are willing to invest into India because as a as a sector, uh, you know, it is uh, it is a sector where you have seen significantly larger companies like, uh, you know, KKR than, uh, you know, BlackRock and everybody is actually, uh, you know, operating, including companies like Sunrise and Sunshore and all. And they are all investing significantly larger amount of capital in India by cre creating separate SPVs. So this is the area which is allowable under 100% FDI, and uh, we only need to follow the norm. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, from a grid stability point of view is concerned, what is the frequency in India? The frequency in India is 14 uh, 49.95 to 50.05. So you can imagine the the width, the, the bandwidth of the uh, you know stability or frequency management is so thin that 10 it is only 10 basis point here and there. And if there is the you know if the frequency actually falls below 49.80 also or or if it goes beyond 50.20 or 30 also, there are significant fluctuations that happen, and we we have probably seen in our childhood days that you know seen blackouts or, or or things like that in the past. So currently we are in la large number of cities. We are probably not seeing those blackouts and all because we are able to manage the frequency. And why this frequency band? Because most of the generation actually happens from thermal management, thermal manufacturing, or thermal production. And thermal in thermal areas. Uh, you know, there is a rotor involved with the thermal plant and that rotor actually takes a lot of time in terms of, uh, um, you know, starting and that that actually creates some point of time, some impact on the um, uh, some impact on the grid and then there is a, there are fluctuations. So 
these are areas of concern. In, in fact, US currently manages a, a frequency of uh, you know, 60, uh, 60 hertz also. So they are able to uh, go to a higher level because they have much more strategic plans in place. They have a five year strategic plan in place for, for, a, for a electricity markets and they keep it, uh, make it rolling. And it's a very significantly large plan with around uh, you know, 75 to 100 page document being maintained by them on a, on a yearly basis. As, as far as uh, you know, when, when there are more renewables like uh, solar power, wind power, uh, you know, because so, solar is available, say, for eight or nine hours during the day, and uh, effective availability is not more than 300 days in a year. And then we talk about, uh, you know, wind. Wind is uh, uh, good in the evening times, uh, but obviously the effective uh, generation of wind, wind actually happens, 80% uh, of the generation actually happens within the five, month, five months of the monsoon and then balance happens over a period of uh, next seven months. So wind also the, the generation is very you know fluctuating and it is not uh, you know if, if the generation whether it is solar or wind keeps fluctuating you will definitely need to have significantly a uh, you know large amount of storage being available with us. So looking at all that uh, I know oversizing of wind power projects or solar power projects and then keeping you know, storing that power at the at the grid level or, or at the storage level will require anything between 6 to 10 percent of the renewables. So if you are going to go ahead with 500 gigawatt of renewable capacity, we will probably need 50 gigawatt of uh, uh, you know storage capacity running for around four to five hours on a daily basis. Uh, so that will mean around 200 to 250 gigawatt hours of uh, storage capacity to be created in India over a period of time in the next say 10 to 12 years. Uh, if you look at some of the recent tenders which have come from GUNL in Gujarat and NTPC and many other companies, including Seki has come out with some tenders. So they have asked for significant capacities to be created on the storage side. And some of the companies have uh, you know, bidded at a very low price because they want to get a market share. So earlier the cost of batteries uh, was around 250 to $300 per kilowatt basis uh, for, for, for a storage perspective, out of which battery cost used to be around $200. Now the battery cost has actually come down to from uh, from two hundred dollars. It has come down to one fifty dollars. So obviously the storage cost has also come down significantly. If you look at some of the recent tenders which have been quoted by a company called Gensol, also the last tender was three rupees forty nine paisa per unit for the storage also. So even storage prices have come down significantly because the battery cost has come down significantly from a peak of lithium pricing of twelve hundred rupees. The pricing has now crashed. Uh, I think it has crashed almost uh, you know seventy eighty percent. So would that with increasing demand the prices are getting more stable and with uh, you know and the, and the impact of commodity cycle will actually go away uh, hopefully in the coming days as the demand stabilizes to a significantly larger uh, level so these are all uh, uh, you know issues as far as india's electricity needs are concerned uh, if you you know let us try and also understand the india's power market because batteries or green batteries will actually contribute in a big way towards India's power requirement also. And the market today is a mix of 90% long term, uh, you know, power, power power contracts because most of our power generation is actually supported from uh, multi-year tariff regulations because generally if the tariff is, tariff is negotiated, it will go on for five years. Uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, quote actually remains for five years and then there are certain norms which uh, government has actually formed and uh, you need to have 14% sort of a return on equity as far as uh, um, um, or you know, government sector companies are concerned. As if, if you are a private sector company, the the return criteria is something in the range of 15.5 to 16 percent. Also on the retail side, the, the the percentages are higher. If you are a retail distribution company, then the ROE is is on the higher side at 16, 17 percent because retail requires large amount of distribution to be done, and distribution requires large amount of expenses at the ground level. So if you look at power market in the US, currently the power market in the US is roughly, uh, you know, 90% short term and 10% long term. And India, the, the scenario is actually the reverse. So we hope that uh, in India, the power market will also move towards a 50-50 scenario in the next, uh, you know, 8 to 10 years. Uh, now, as we are moving more towards the renewables and also there is, uh, there are issues like, uh, um, you know, rotor, in the rotor uh, uh, efficiency and all. Uh, we need to have significantly larger capacity. So if you look at current scenario in India, we currently have 430 gigawatt of capacity overall, including thermal renewable and all. Out of which 250 to 260 gigawatt is currently under usage. And as you, as renewable capacity is 175 gigawatt and available for say 40% uh, of the time, uh, the high, they, this is uh, leading to higher capacities because the efficiency is lower. Average efficiency for a coal-fired plant is in the range of 75 to 85%. And depending on what is the life, you know, what is the age of the plant. 
But as far as renewables are concerned, the average uh, efficiency is not more than 20%. As far as wind is concerned, I think it is around 25%. And uh, um, you know, batteries obviously will have will, be, will have large efficiency because whatever is stored is probably you know stored and then discharged at at a certain point of time in the in the evening or whatever. The round trip round trip efficiency for batteries is in the range of around 80 85 percent. So if you are storing 100 units during the day during the sunny days, maybe 80 units or 85 units can be used in the evening. So round trip efficiency for batteries is in the range of 80 85 percent. Uh, one, one very important parameter that we really need, need to look at because India is growing very fast. We are currently a $4 trillion economy. We currently have a f almost four and a half, five trillion dollars of market cap. So, you know, as the government is planning very aggressively in terms of uh, corporate growth and, you know, industrial growth, uh, we are looking at becoming a $10 trillion economy by 2030. If all this has to be achieved, then reliability of power is something which is a very big issue for, in, for India. In US, as I said, they, they uh, do significant amount of R&D on a continuous basis, and they, uh, you know, keep promoting. Uh, uh, they keep promoting various projects so that they can address reliability. If you look at US population is around 35, 40 crore rupees, but if you look at North America, which also includes Canada and other other areas, the the area of reliability for power in in, in the in the uh, uh, in the space that this reliability corporation in the US actually operates uh, almost covers 35 to 40 crore people. So. They believe that uh, you know reliability is a very important factor, and as for a World Bank report, uh, as of 2019, in terms of reliability, we stand at 141. Assuming that uh, you know we would have improved significantly from there because uh, there is no report which has come out from World Bank in terms of reliability after 2019. You know, even if today we stand at 25 number, that number still needs to be improving because we can't be the third largest economy globally with the reliability of power. Uh, you know, which, which is not within the first five or within the first 10. So this is an area of work which needs to be done. I have done a study of electricity regulatory corporations globally covering five countries and that, that actually throws a very big light in terms of how things can be, you know, made uh, better in India. I did a, I, I, my report is already submitted to Central Electricity Authority chairman uh, and, and the uh, team members already. And uh, I hope to get, a, you know, some amount of audience in terms of how things can be improved from uh, the regulatory perspective and how things are happening globally. I think that particular discussion is something which is very important for India, and I think that discussion will probably happen at some point of time. So, you know, uh, energy storage again, I said 500 gigawatt target by 2030. Again, uh, you know, 10% of the energy storage would mean for 50 gigawatt, and running for say four to six hours will mean, will mean around 200 to 300 gigawatts of gigawatt hour of energy storage. So, the calculation is that 50 gigawatt. Running for uh, six hours will become 300 gigawatt hours, and for 50 gigawatt running for four hours will become 200 gigawatt hours. So that's the kind of capacity it needs to be created in the country. Uh, there are there are additional capacities could could come from pump storage. Pump storage is where you know water flows from top uh, bottom to top uh, through motors, and then when it, when it runs down, uh, the efficiency or the the power generated or the energy generated by running down of the water will be actually put into a motor and the motor will run to generate electricity again. So these are all some of the projects that a lot of uh, tenders have been actually floated and government is very keen to promote both battery storage as well as pump storage. So that is an area where, uh, you know, and as far as battery storage is concerned, if the requirement is going to be in the range of 200 to 2 to 350 gigawatt hour, these are all most of the reports which are coming from, uh, you know, various organizations, including my previous organization where I used to work. And uh, we were actually one of the pioneers in terms of the alternative cell chemistry policy and the advocacy at the government level also. So these are some of the estimates which are com coming from large number of uh, consultants who are locally as well as globally. So as far as transportation are concerned, uh, from a usage perspective, as we have uh, you know, studied green batteries, what are the, the, the uses of buses? Uh, uh, uses for green batteries, they are basically buses which are, uh, you would have seen, uh, uh, electric buses running in various cities or even intercity also. Then trucks, mini trucks also also running on, yeah, uh, uh, you know, batteries. Then two wheelers, three wheelers, passenger cars. You would have seen significant amount of Tata, Nexon, or uh, you know, various other Tata vehicles and few other vehicles which have come on batteries. There are also significantly higher number of vehicles which are running on hybrid, which are running on hybrid technology. And during using the hybrid technology, as the vehicle is running on petrol or diesel, the battery actually indirectly gets charged. And there is no separate charging infrastructure which is required for a hybrid vehicle. Then we are also have some ships uh, getting deployed in India, and government is very keen to promote uh, 
uh, you know, by transportation of goods and service goods basically through shipping because if the cost of, uh, uh, you know, normal normal transportation is 7 rupee 50 pesos per kilometer or whatever, then the cost of, uh, uh, you know, ship transportation uh, will be not will be not more than 50 or 60 pesos, assuming that battery storage is used and the cost of batteries is uh, uh, currently under, under higher side, I don't think the cost will actually go beyond 75 pesos. So even if we are able to move towards, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent of our uh, goods movement within the country, we are able to move towards uh, shipping then we'll probably be able to save significant level of uh, you know, cost. If you uh, remember a parameter uh, which actually came in the papers, we talked, Mr. Gadkari talked about a few days before, is that the GDP, uh, you know, transportation cost as a percentage of GDP today is in the range of around 12 to 13 percent for India. Globally, the average is not more than nine and most of the very highly developed nation, the cost is around eight percent. So India basically, if you look at the, the moment of or, or you know, uh, capacity of roads that are getting built all over the country and we've seen around uh, uh, you know almost uh, uh, 40 50 100 kilometers of roads getting built on a daily basis so uh, uh, you know because the roads are infrastructure is getting better the vehicle usage will actually also go become better and that will mean significantly higher number of uh, uh, you know usage for batteries also in the coming days and uh, this will also aid in terms of uh, better transportation so other than shipping uh, you know defense equipments mining equipment, space equipments, then, you know, uh, today we can actually look at uh, batteries as not uh, really being an industrial product. No, uh, we, we agree that it will be used in transportation. It will be used in, uh, you know, buses. It will be used in shipping. It will be used in various other trucks also. It will also be used for, you know, storage requirements. But if you really look at uh, the kind of uh, the usage of batteries, I mean, retail goods like laptops, watches, phones, etc. I mean, if you look at batteries that even reached our heart, right? The pacemaker that we, most of the people are actually suffering from heart ailments, are, you know, pacemaker is actually put up. They will also realize that the, the, the they have to use batteries for running the pacemaker. So this is the kind of level of penetration that actually has actually happened. So if you look at on a, on a per family basis, how the deployment of batteries actually happened, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is electronics, uh, you know, we use smartphones, laptops, toys, home appliances and other devices. So if you look at a family of uh, four people out of which husband and wife are staying together and the kids are out for education uh, in a flat where which is a two bedroom flat, the number of batteries that are used at any point of time actually varies from 50 to 60, 15 to 60 batteries at any point of time. So if you uh, you know imagine two laptops running, two phones running, then you know two dongles running, maybe uh, or, you know some toys are being played, or whatever uh, by the children, uh, the number of uh, uh, you know batteries under usage, you know, then the then the mobile, then the TV, uh, uh, TV TV remote also has a battery in it. So if you look at all the kind of parameters that are actually required, um, or you know, then uh, the number of batteries at any point of time used by a family will be in the range of 50 to 15 to 60 batteries at any point of time. So you can imagine how personal the product has become. So not only that, it is a very critical uh, element of our life because energy is without energy, nothing can actually happen. Nothing can be produced. Nothing can be run. You know, we cannot lead our, our life today without energy. We are so much dependent on energy so that uh, this, this is the kind of and, and, and ultimately batteries have become a very, very personal product. You know, people use two phones, people use watches. So, um, uh, you know, everything has become your even car key, which runs on, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, we, which we use on a daily basis, then, uh, you know, so many other parameters are there or everything, um, you know, is, is basically being run on batteries. So it's very difficult to really live uh, without batteries. And if you think the usage per person is, uh, uh, you know, 10 or 15 batteries on a per person basis, you can imagine the world population is today almost 750 crores. So what can, what are the kind of number of batteries that will be required if you look at from a green, green battery perspective in the future. Now let us look at the broad numbers. These numbers I have taken from Vahana website. So India currently has 21, 22 crore two wheelers. India has seven crore passenger cars. Buses are 20 lakhs. Trucks are almost a crore and then three wheelers. And then you assume a scenario of then the government has a penetration target of 30% new mobility coming from electric vehicles by 2030. So you assume a scenario that 25 crore will be the number of two wheelers and passenger cars will become eight crores. Buses will become 75 lakhs because more buses are required on the road for public transportation, then trucks will become one to one and a half crores and three wheelers will also double. 
Now you look at, uh, uh, you know, if you take a penetration of 7 to 10 percent, so 7 percent of 25 crores is 1.75 crores. And like that, if you take the passenger cars and, you know, everything, you can imagine the kind of number of uh, EVs that will be on roads by 203 or maybe one or two years here or there. So the average size of the battery that is required is, you know, for a two wheeler, it is two kilowatt. For a passenger car, it is 35 kilowatt. For a bus, it is 200 kilowatt. In reality, the, uh, you know, the bus, uh, uh, kilowatt hour is actually higher. It, it should actually be in the range of 250. Uh, trucks, it is in the range of 8200. And the three wheelers, which are last mile three wheelers for uh, you know goods delivery or last mile, uh, uh, you know, Sheru rickshaws, which are actually operating in Delhi. If you have seen them, they all use five kilowatt hour batteries. So if you just multiply these numbers and come out with the kind of capacity that is required for batteries, we require for 10% average penetration of, of electric vehicles in the country. This is without considering the grid requirement. Huh? This is without any grid requirement. We are at almost 750 gigawatt hour. So 750 gigawatt hour will effectively mean an investment of, uh, uh, you know, roughly at 500 crore plus per, per, per gigawatt hour. It will actually mean an investment of around uh, three to three and a half lakh crores. So at three to three and a half lakh crores, assuming that uh, the turnover to investment ratio will be in the range of two and a half to three times. We will actually have a 10 lakh crore turnover size of industry from batteries in the in the next uh, you know 10 to 12 years or maybe 15 years. So uh, if you look at 740 uh, you know gigawatt hour as as a 10 percent contribution from India side in terms of green batteries, then the world actually requires 7,400 gigawatt hour, which is actually called as 7.4 terawatt hours. So US is will US will probably require a significantly larger amount of batteries in the coming days because they have 80% cars and we have 80% uh, two wheelers. So that's the kind of scenario that is emerging, uh, you know, from a battery perspective. There was a report uh, which was released by Niti Aayog a few years back, which said that in by 2030, India will probably require 300 to 350 gigawatt hour of import of batteries. So today we are dependent on, uh, you know, fossil fuel because 85% of our crude is getting imported from various countries. Uh, tomorrow it should not happen that we are again dependent on outsiders for batteries also. So that's why government is actually incentivizing a lot of things and you know, trying to ensure that local production can happen. This will not only ensure that we uh, Indians get more jobs and you know people get more employment. It will also mean that dependence on foreign goods becomes lesser. And then we are also able to create uh, you know, low cost manufacturing setups, which will actually help in terms of more exports in the coming days. So broadly, you look at uh, I just put this uh, you know buses scenario because a lot of people are traveling today by buses and trains. But buses understanding buses, buses is very important because Niti Aayog has come out with a report saying that by 2030 or 2032, 60% of India's population will be staying in in cities. So if you look at the bus scenario, corporate buses are 1.5 to 2 lakh, intercity buses are 12 lakh, school buses are 4 lakh, city ST buses are 2 lakhs, and the uh, population of buses per million in India is roughly 1500 buses. If you look at a country like Thailand, Thailand, which is majorly driven by, uh, you know, tourist uh, visits, it has 8,500 buses per million. Brazil, South Africa, which are more comparable to India, uh, they currently have something like 5,000 buses per million. So if you multiply today's population of 140 crore, or maybe, you know, few years down the line, the population, population is 150 crores, multiply that by 5,000, India needs around 75 lakh buses in the coming years. So the current number of buses are 20. You need 75 by in the next, in the next 8 to 10 years. So we need additional 55 lakh buses. And at that additional 55 lakh buses, uh, at say 80 lakh per bus uh, as a EV co cost of EV bus on average side, you know. Today, the cost of a 9 meter bus is uh, 1 crore. The cost of a 12 meter bus is 1.5 crores. I have taken it at 80 lakhs, considering it as, it as an average of the next 8 years. So we require something, we, you know, we'll only require buses. The opportunity for buses in India is 40, 44 lakh crores as the market size. And you know today battery cost is 40 45 percent of a bus cost so you can imagine the kind of number of batteries that are required i talked about a battery turnover of 10 lakh crores here the issue if you look at say 44 lakhs into 45 percent uh, the requirement of batteries will be almost 20 lakh crores so that's the kind of size of market and the opportunity we're talking about from an indian perspective then again retrofitment of buses two wheelers three wheelers is a big opportunity but obviously every company wants to sell the new vehicle because retrofitted bus will be 20 lakhs cheaper than say uh, the bus cost of 80 lakh rupees. So nobody wants to lose that revenue of 20 lakh rupees on a per bus basis. So they are more uh, focused on, uh, you know, selling new buses. But government is in a way trying to push for uh, retrofitment because there are out of 2 lakh, uh, you know, CTUS2 buses in India, around 50,000 buses can actually be retrofitted. 
and those if those those retrofitment can be done the bus life actually can be enhanced by another five to seven years so these are the kind of opportunities from a buses perspective in india so you know from a from a uh, bus perspective the average battery size is 300 kilowatt hour uh, you know the uh, and uh, you know this is a project which i had done when i was doing my mba at uh, you know iit kanpur i'm i'm mba in power system regulations and economics from iit kanpur and this model was actually submitted to IIT Kanpur financial model as vehicle to grid because once you have one lakh or two lakh uh, buses on road, what will those buses do if the buses are getting parked in the factories or offices during the daytime and they can actually be charged during the daytime? And what will they do in the second shift when the when the, again the uh, uh, people are working and you know buses are, are remaining idle? So how can that battery storage or energy storage can actually be used? So if you look at average but bus runs for around 9 to 10 hours so which are in three shift operations so you know government of india guidelines uh, allow up to 300 to 400 kilowatt you know discharge and discharge of uh, uh, batteries during the uh, during the daytime as well as discharge in the evening time so assuming a 70 percent you uh, see uh, usage of batteries for secondary purposes for charging and discharging we can definitely on a per battery basis uh, you know, generate and uh, charge and discharge 200 kilowatt hour Uh, or are actually done some of the other production requirements. So if company has uh, any company has a 10 buses remaining idle during the uh, uh, you know daytime or in the evening time, maybe they can generate uh, 200 uh, or 2,000 2, units of power in the in the in the, in the evening time, which can actually be used for buses. So this is the kind of scenario from a vehicle to be perspective, and we need a biaxial charger which can be used for around four to five buses at one point of time. Uh, on a on a one hour basis so one hour is good enough for charging of 200 kilowatt hours and discharge uh, you know during the same time so depreciation can be charged on on the number of hours that the battery is actually getting used for and this is the model which i had built and it has been accepted by iit kanpur so uh, you know and then charging during the daytime and discharge during the evening time so assuming that we are able to charge the battery during the daytime at 4 rupees per unit then the discharge can be done in the evening at 5 rupees 90 pesa assuming a 14% return on equity for the invest, proportionate investment that is carried out in batteries. So this is a broad vehicle to grid model, which can actually be, which actually become very, very effective and operational for all those companies who are planning to go ahead with electric buses in the future. Even passenger cars or, or employee cars can even be charged and discharged like this. And you know, one needs to evolve the system and that that's an area of improvement or that's an area of, uh, of new work for Indian companies or Indian employees in the coming days. So potential for B2G government has targeted, you know, 30% electric mobility by 2030. India sales more than 40,000 to, 80, to around 80,000 buses per annum. So assuming, uh, you know, average 60,000 buses are sold and 30% uh, penetration by 2030, we can probably see one lakh electric buses in the market by 2030. Uh, in, India currently only has 15,000 e-buses on road. So the, the potential is significantly higher. And at one lakh uh, buses and assuming, as I say, 200 kilowatt, uh, or a 200 unit generation on, on a daily basis, it can actually provide a uh, capacity of around 20 to 25 gigawatt hour, depending on the actual usage. And this can mean a significantly larger grid support. So if you have seen uh, the numbers, we require something like 200 or 250 gigawatt hour of uh, you know energy storage. So part of it, 10% now at one lakh buses can actually come from vehicle to grid. So if you are able to move towards four or five lakh buses uh, capacity, Maybe if you 40 to 50 percent of India's storage problem can actually be taken care through, uh, you know, vehicle to grid as a as an opportunity for Indian companies. Uh, you know, we can actually add 10 lakh buses. We can actually address 200 gigawatt hour. So electric mobility and passenger cars, uh, you know, has a potential to really mitigate uh, the full requirements of getting back, you know, grid storage in the coming days. So that's the kind of potential because see, once the bus is purchased and once the passenger car is purchased, bus is purchased by the CTU SDU, or the passenger car is actually purchased by uh, you know, people like us individually, then the car actually remains at the at the workplace, you know, for seven or eight hours without actually getting used effectively. So that is an area where things can be actually work out. And uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, you, the more usage actually leads to re reducing life for batteries. But obviously, if you use it efficiently using BMS and other things, there will not be heating or thermal management problems. And then those problems, those problems are mitigated. We can effectively have some amount of secondary income also for all of us individually and the bus car, bus uh, companies also who are deploying these buses on rental basis to various companies. Then you know, assume a scenario from a hydrogen uh, trucks perspective because 
as most of you would be aware, Reliance has worked out uh, internal combustion engine hydrogen technology, and they are actually doing trials for those this technology in, in Jamnagar. And uh, they produce large amount of uh, uh, you know green hydrogen, the uh, gray hydrogen. If they are able to do the carbon capture, they will be able to generate the blue hydrogen. And uh, you know Reliance is one of the large companies where, which or actually owns large amount of fleet in India, and they want to convert that fleet into ice hydrogen uh, technology. They have invested in ice hydrogen technology. So you know they are they are doing trials currently, and but even if they have to use ice hydrogen bus, they, each each truck will actually require a bus or a truck will actually require a 80 to 100 kilowatt hour battery because uh, you know you sometimes require say if a bus is climbing up or a truck is climbing climbing up a, a very steep area, it can actually mean a significantly higher uh, you know power requirement at the initial level, and that is all can be supported through battery. So 80 to 100 kilowatt hour of battery requirement is there. Peak and drop battery requirement is there. This will actually mean if you multiply 80 to 100 gigawatt by one crore buses, uh, or, you know, or, or sorry, 10 lakh buses, this will actually mean 100 gigawatt of battery capacity only required for trucks in India. So you can imagine and see the kind of opportunity that is there for from Indian perspective. Then, as far as um, uh, you know, various government supports are concerned, government announced alternate cell chemistry production link incentives, uh, you know, plan for cell manufacturing, which is almost 18,000 crores worth of uh, you know incentives. Then focus is on localization. They want uh, a 60% value addition by fifth year beginning and 25% value addition in the first two years. Supply chain needs uh, needs to go green and improve local presence. Recycling use norms are in place, and a few companies are doing recycling. As I said in the past, there are eight, seven, eight Indian companies who are actually looking at recycling as a very important area, and they are doing work in this. Few good uh, lithium reserves have been found in JNK and Karnataka and India. Being part of the Quad, uh, you know, critical mineral partnership, this should help in terms of uh, securing the energy for uh, uh, India and countering China because China controls 90% of the critical minerals as far as the world is concerned. Then the government has actually also come out with Fame One and Fame, uh, sorry, Fame One and Two policies, and they have actually announced a large amount of subsidy for batteries. And Fame Two policies were very effective in the first bus tender, and those those bus tenders uh, which were actually declared. Uh, uh, taken out for 5,500 buses, out of which Tata Motors actually got 4,700 buses. So they got a significantly higher level of uh, you know subsidy. The entire 40-45 percent of the battery cost is being subsidized because this this will actually fall form under Fame 2 policy, and because of that they could actually were able to quote at a very low price for a uh, running of bus on a per kilometer basis because mo because most of the contracts which are uh, uh, running for uh, uh, you know, corporate bus management or employee management, employee travel are actually run on a, on a rental basis, and uh, uh, these buses will be run uh, at various cities and city transport units by company, uh, Tata Motors, uh, you know, Smart Mobility, and they have quoted a rate which is almost 20% discount to a uh, internal combustion engine bus because of the subsidies being available on these buses from the government side. Even uh, states governments are actually giving significant subsidies. You know, state like Maharashtra gives. Till a few days before it used to give 1.5 lakh as subsidy on EVs. If you're purchasing an EV, they'll give you a subsidy. So, you know, broadly, if you look at two wheeler scenario in India from a pricing perspective, uh, you know, these are prices which I've taken from the site, uh, you know, bikedeco.com. Uh, so you can look at Bajaj Chetak, what is the price, Ola, then TVS, IQ, Bathar, and, you know, Hero Electrics. So the price ranges from, say, 87,000 to, you know, as high as, uh, um, uh, you know, 1.6 lakhs or 1.68 lakhs. So in, in this particular scenario, the battery cost is something in the range of 40-45%. And that's why a very important emerging scenario that is coming in India is, uh, 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 you know, basically towards uh, battery strapping as a, as a um, you know, business model. And uh, as I said, India has 20 to 23 crores of two-wheelers and three-wheeler population. And a typical two-wheeler requires two to three kilowatt hour batteries. And uh, you know, L3, L5 vehicle actually requires 5 kilowatt hour battery. So the cost of the battery is between 40,000 rupees per battery to 80,000 rupees per battery. And battery costs are major costs in, in an EV. So, you know, if you really minus the battery cost from 1, 1 lakh, uh, you know, 20,000 rupees, you minus, subtract 40,000 rupees or 50,000 rupees, the vehicle, uh, you know, naked vehicle cost is in the range of 70 to 80,000 rupees. And if somebody is able to purchase the vehicle and, and do a swapping of batteries at any point of time, you know, he doesn't need to really invest for 50,000 rupees for batteries also. And that becomes a very effective model because if three wheelers are able to, uh, you know, replace a battery of 80,000 or 90,000 rupees and not invest in that, uh, you know, their paybacks could be faster. They can use uh, the, take up the battery in the morning 
run their 150 200 kilometers on a daily basis and then probably return the battery in the evening and uh, you know uh, uh, take take the new battery uh, typical battery swapping will require you know for against one battery requirement they will probably have to keep a storage of 1.75 batteries there's a broad model that uh, one loom one has to really look at and uh, um, uh, or you know, uh, as the as the size of the, the vehicle actually goes up, the battery uh, weight also goes up. Uh, if you look at a typical two wheeler uh, battery, the size of the battery, the weight of the battery is between four to eight kgs. For a five kilowatt hour, uh, the weight is fifteen to twenty kgs, and all these weights can actually be absorbed. You know, but if you look at a bus, the, the the weight of the battery is between six forty to thousand kgs, which is difficult to be you know carried along, difficult to, to be swapped also. And um, that is why two wheeler, three wheeler battery swapping businesses have come up very well in the country. There are a few companies, including Battery Smart, and there is one company also in Kerala. They have put up large businesses from a battery swapping perspective. So, this is the emerging scenario as far as battery swapping is concerned in India. And this is broadly the uh, opportunity from a uh, green battery perspective businesses in the country. As I said, battery has more emerged as a personal. Uh, uh, you know, usage product, and at any point of time, 15 to 20 batteries are being used by by a single person or a family of two people. Batteries is emerging as a significant source of energy because it is a transport. It is a transportable energy source. It is probably need not uh, you know require except for charging purpose. It, it can probably you know our phone battery can actually run for 12, 15 hours or maybe more if you are even though we might be a very aggressive or very high user. So this is the kind of scenario that is that has actually emerged as far as you know, green batteries are concerned. I hope I am able to throw uh, good light to all the listeners. Uh, and if there are any questions, I can take it up. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Um, there are a few questions. Uh, it would be great if you can enlighten us on this. Uh, yeah, one sure. of our uh, participants has asked. That what is the hydrogen train concept? Is it an alternative to the batteries? Hydrogen? Uh, train concept concept. No, the first time the train is being uh, you know thought over and is getting implemented. The government has said by December they will implement hydrogen train project. It's a pilot project, I think, for a few kilometers from some small place uh, in Chandigarh, I think, uh, to one of the places in Himachal. That they also want to probably test in terms of how hydrogen can power the vehicle because it's literally going up the hills. So they are trying to first imp implement, and as you probably be, must be reading about electrification of railways, you know, 65 70 percent of the railways have already been electrified. So, uh, you know, and then they'll probably start using in some way renewable power also in the, in the, in the coming days. So they want to experiment with hydrogen. So if hydrogen becomes a successful attempt, then they'll probably power the trains using hydrogen as a fuel. Okay. Yeah. And another question, sir, is hydrogen generated using thorium nuclear plants, green hydrogen? No, no, hydrogen is generated in three, four ways. One is uh, one is your gray hydrogen, which is generated using uh, steam methane reformation process from LNG. So LNG is currently an imported fuel in India. And, uh, you know, you crack the crack the LNG and, uh, and then hydrogen is generated and then that hydrogen can be used for uh, uh, you know, cracking purposes uh, in the in the fertilizer plants and refineries. So India currently uses around eight percent of the world hydrogen. So you know, we are one of the largest users of hydrogen. We currently consume seven million metric tons of hydrogen. So we are not a small user of hydrogen. So we are very well, very much aware. So hydrogen can be generated from LNG. It can be generated from you know uh, splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen using the electrolysis as a process. It can also be generated from biomass. Uh, you know, then all these are green uh, uh, electrolysis mm. then green hydrogen, uh, sorry, biomass. These are all uh, green hydrogen areas. Uh, what is generated from LNG is a gray hydrogen. But if you capture the carbon in that process, it can actually become a blue hydrogen. So government actually has come out with the policy and they're, uh, uh, I think, not uh, uh, not averse to people using blue hydrogen because at least uh, the emissions from hydrogen are zero, nil. If you're using hydrogen as a fuel, whether it's a blue hydrogen or, or a green hydrogen, the emissions from hydrogen are nil. So that is the experiment which I, I believe Reliance is trying to do, uh, where whereby they will be using you know their own blue hydrogen for transporting their own vehicles in in, in within the country. Okay, yeah. sir. Another question, like what are the potential environmental and econ environmental we have discussed, you have discussed, and the economic impacts of developing a domestic green battery manufacturing industry in India. 
see obviously uh, uh, you know as i said lithium has certain challenges uh, the cost of re uh, recycling of lithium currently is on the higher side and as the technology says that we 95% of the lithium can be recycled but obviously the cost has to be lower than you know your original purchase cost then there will mm -hmm. be people will actually go for recycling so these kind of technologies is, are there currently in china india some companies are already working on recycling lithium and other critical minerals from batteries and i think once those technologies get stabilized probably the recycling itself will become a very large business in india and recycling norms are in place uh, you know and government is very keen to promote that because once recycling gets established in the country uh, you know mm. our dependency on imported raw material will actually go down so yes. that is initially obviously every every new concept or new technology will have some challenges mm. from green perspective initially uh, but you know unless you start using it how we can actually you know move towards green so that is a that is something which needs to be understood and that is why government is incentivizing mm. so many sectors mm -hmm. if you look at all the pls schemes put together not only for green batteries or green hydrogen or, but for mm -hmm. also even for say, sectors like semiconductors or textile or whatever government has almost given 2 lakh crore worth of incentives okay. so there is another like you discussed about the fame by the indian government like uh, in what ways could uh, green batteries contribute to the vision of atmanirbhar bharat by fostering a self reliance in india's battery production the yeah, other said uh, you know the requirement of batteries is going to be anything between 700 to 1000 gigawatt hour for india so if you are able to localize the supply chain here uh, uh, you know in a big way uh, mm -hmm. it will obviously mean that uh, you know our lithium can be recycled our sodium can be recycled and hmm. we we need uh, we might need some additional quantity on a, on a yearly basis but if we are able to do recycle hmm. 70 80 90% of that uh, you know hmm. we can at least use them and ensure that a uh, large amount of internal energy requirements can be mitigated hmm. and as i said uh, uh, during my lecture that india is trying to go from a 4 trillion dollar economy to 10 yes. trillion dollar economy but the yes. energy needs are going to only increase so, so we can imagine a energy energy cr scenario in india which is currently at 1200 units and say moving to around 3000 or 4000 mm. units on a per capita basis and maybe 20 25% of that coming from batteries so you know you can imagine the kind of requirement for india in the coming years and as yes. our population is also increasing we are a large country we are we are a uh, country which is which has got uh, limited land resources it's not a case that mm. you know our, our land availability today is 1/4 of us and our population is four times that of us Uh, so another thing like uh, how does the use of recyclable and biobased materials in green batteries align with india's circular economy ambitions yeah government has come out with very good uh, very clear plans on circularity so it will obviously aligns very well in terms of uh, you know india's plans for circularity and government is promoting that in a big way so uh, Uh, and and i am very sure government uh, you know and then things are getting rewarded if you are aware i was part of a, a presentation done to uh, to pmo in terms of why india needs carbon markets and i did a similar presentation to dr raju kumar at uh, vice chairman at niti ayog so uh, you know and then those guidelines have already been framed and then ccts what we call it as ccts carbon credit trading scheme is already under uh, you know implementation the law has already been passed and we are hoping a few days before that is two or three days before uh, bureau of energy efficiency has come out with the clear guidelines in terms of how uh, you know carbon trading will actually happen and we are now awaiting the uh, 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 starting of international carbon exchange limited which is likely to get operated in gibb city in gujarat and uh, i think we'll probably see significant level of re recyclability recirculability you know reusage of waste then use of renewable energy use of hydrogen as a fuel will get rewarded through uh, carbon credits getting issued so one ton of carbon emission saving like, you know will actually get one cer that is carbon emission reduction certificate and emission trading system mm -hmm. is a very large business in the in the entire europe and the emissions are actually traded between anything between 40 euro per ton to 120 euro per ton so india is proposing a pricing in the range of 10 to 15 uh, you know dollars per ton of carbon so even if that that actually starts in a in a big way because we will definitely have large amount of carbon emission opportunities getting traded here in india mm -hmm. so once the exchange starts i think we'll see lot more action and there are mm -hmm. few sectors which have already been defined by the government where trading will actually become compulsory and they will also be capped and traded so capped and traded means that uh, 
people will be given targets on a yearly basis that this particular sector, you know, your current emissions are X, Y, Z. You need to reduce them down by 20% on a yearly basis. And then that ultimately the objective is what? Objective is net zero, right? So government has declared a net zero target of 2070. Yes. And there are some corporates which have said that they will probably do net zero much earlier. Reliance has said they will do net zero much earlier. Dalmia mm -hmm. Cement has said they will do it by 2040. Tata Group has said they will do by 2050. So these different you know, groups are taken different targets. So I think all these recirculability, recyclability, you know, use of green hydrogen, all these will actually pave uh, much bigger uh, opportunity for Indian companies in terms of generating carbon credits, and those credits will ultimately get traded on the exchange. Okay. So uh, my last question also get answered with this, like that how the green batteries fit into India's long-term energy strategy for transitioning into cleaner renewable energy sources. Yeah, see, because as I said uh, during my uh, you know speech that uh, thermal energy actually it is dependent on rotor and rotor takes a lot of time for you know starting and, uh, and generating electricity. Green battery stored energy is something which is instantaneous. So any any incremental requirement of energy can be you know made through green battery st storage. Obviously, there are round trip losses also, but uh, even if we are able to use it to the extent of 70, 80 percent also, I think they will probably be the one of the strongest points uh, in terms of making India much more stable from a you know energy perspective, and I think mm -hmm. as I said, 10 to 12 percent, or maybe 8 to 10 percent, or 8 to 12 percent of the uh, requirement of uh, you know power will actually come from these kind of uh, resources, which significantly need around 50 to 60 gigawatt hours of gigawatt of uh, battery production capacity, which will be running for four to six hours because India's peak hours are two, you know, seven to nine in the morning and seven to eleven in the night. So we yes. we require six hours of peak energy which can in a big way supported through uh, uh, storage. So if you take 24 hours energy consumption or maybe effectively assuming that we sleep during the night for around six hours, uh, you know, we assume that around 18 to 20 hours of peak energy requirements, including six hours of very peak energy. I think mm -hmm. 35 to 40 percent of India's peak energy requirement can be met through storage. And that is where green batteries can be of significant you know, usage. Sir, thank you, sir. Sir, there is another one last question, sir. Yeah. If you permit me, uh, like um, if is the hybrid model of engine is better option. See why people are preferring hydro, uh, hybrid model because uh, you know charging infrastructure is an issue today, and they have made it in such a way that during the time uh, the vehicle is running, you know some amount of energy is passed on to ensure that the batteries are charged. So there is no separate charging required. But as the charging penetration infrastructure grows in the country, or there are more mobile charging companies that are coming forward. And you know, coming to your and my home for charging of batteries when our vehicle is actually, uh, you know, not getting used in the evening for three, four hours. Maybe those mm. kind of companies will come forward. Those business models will also evolve. So if that those kind of business model evolve, so battery charging will not be uh, become a big issue. And then there are significantly higher level of uh, you know efforts going on to increase the wattage of the chargers. Also, recently That's a it. company in Bangalore has come out with a. Uh, you know, very fast charger which can actually charge a 300 kilowatt hour battery within 15 minutes. So if the bus mm -hmm. is say going from one one place to another place and the driver is actually resting for a while or having lunch or whatever, mm -hmm. during those 15 20 minutes the battery can be entire 300 kilowatt hour battery can be charged. Yes. So these are the kind of technological improvements which will help in terms of penetration. And once the penetration happens, I think all these issues and problems will get over soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to you, sir. I mean, uh, for delivering such an insightful and en engaging address. Your presentation has provided us with deeper understanding, sir. I mean, we truly appreciate the time and expertise you have shared and undoubtedly our enriching our experiences and also the way you have addressed our questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you once again for being with us today and for, con for contributing significantly to the success of our webinar. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Aditi, ma'am. Thank you, Institute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank now, you. before we wrap up, it's time to thank a few more. Uh, but before that, uh, uh, since today is the 25th, you all must be aware that we've released our October issue of Sukhina Bhavantu. Kindly go through it, and I request all the participants to uh, you can also uh, give us a uh, submit articles for uh, Sukhina Bhavantu and um, uh, just lock your calendars for the coming 
Vasudeva Kutumbaka Babila series also. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, I want to thank our president, Semi Bibuti Bhushan Nayak sir, Semi uh, TCS Trini Prasad, Sinivacha Prasad sir, our vice president, ICMAI, uh, CMA Dr. Ashish Thakre sir, uh, chairman SSP, and all the members of the Sustainability Standard Board. I would also like to thank CMA Dipendu Roy sir, secretary of SSP and additional director ICMAI for his continuous support and motivation. Thank you all for participating and have a great weekend with this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank Thank you.